morning's gospel is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 3, verses 15 through 22. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, Jesus, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming, and I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, and was praying that the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let our praying continue. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts indeed be used by you, translated by the Holy Spirit to again pour into our souls, for we are thirsty, we are hungry for you. Amen. So I've seen some of you since 2015, but Happy New Year! Happy New Year. I spent the first day of this new year um, in my hometown near Harrisonburg, Virginia. My brother called us that day. He lives about six miles away from my parents and said, why don't we as a family go over to the Jones house? The Jones house is a small one-story home that my grandparents bought many, many years ago. Mr. Jones lived in it for a long time. And at some point, it became my first home my brother, myself, and my parents. As we walked through that small home, there were these, the, the, a chorus, right, of I remembers. My dad said, I remember I made that coat rack that is hanging right there on the porch. My brother said, I remember when we used to sit next to the wall registers and put our blankets over it and create tents to capture the warmth from the oil furnace. My mom, she remembers the weekly bleaching of all the small closets to keep the mildew and mold at bay as best she could. And this was my first home. So this was the place of my first lost tooth, my first uh, hide and seek and shoots and ladders games. I remember the first time baking cookies with my mom. I remember my first bee sting in the backyard. I remember how sweet that grape was, that scuppernog grape off the vine in the backyard. I Remember, because this place is the place where I began to be shaped and formed, a place of identity for me. I wish I had time to go around and sit with each of you and hear your story of that first place in your life. Places that were beautiful, places that were difficult. We have certain traditional markers of identity, don't we? Home and community, family, career. But those markers of identity have actually begun to diminish quite a bit because very few of us anymore grow up in the same town or community. Very few of us have the same career our whole lives, and many of us knows the grief and the heartache of families that are no longer intact. And the diminishing of these markers of identity have left us with an immense craving, right? A craving to know who we are. 
And in the midst of this desire to know who I am and who Matt is and who Shirley is, there is a great temptation. In fact, Henry Nouwen would say it's the greatest spiritual temptation. The temptation to trust in identities that have nothing to do with who God created us to be. I'll ask, who am I? And I want to answer that with what I do for a living. And that's fine and good when things are going well or when I'm having successes, but what about not if I fail, but when I fail? And what about that moment when we can no longer do our jobs, right? When we grow older. Then what? Who am I then? I ask, who am I? You ask, who am I? And sometimes we answer, well, I am what other people say I am. And when people speak highly, we walk freely until they speak negatively. And the knife cuts deep into self-identity. Why would I, why would we want to give another so much power over who we are? I ask, who am I? You ask, who am I? And sometimes we say, well, I am what I have. Dr. Brennan, thank goodness I have my health. I have my family. I have my husband. I have my children. I have my education. But all those things will one day be gone. And then who am I? The greatest spiritual temptation is to trust in identities that have nothing to do with our identity in Christ. The good news is, is we don't face that temptation alone because Jesus faces it as well. Our story of Jesus ended last Sunday, right, with the Magi, the wise men, coming and then leaving, going home another way to tell the world that, yes, this is Jesus, he's among us. But then after that, for 30 years, we don't hear anything about Jesus' life story. Some people believe that Jesus went east. Others think that maybe he went west. Some think he learned Greek wisdom. Or perhaps he was an Essene monk in a desert commune. But somewhere along the way, we know he picked up carpentry. He learned a little fishing, maybe. But I wonder, at what point did Jesus know his destiny? At what point did Mary stop pondering all these things in her heart, right, and share with Jesus the story of the star and the angel and the magi? Did she hold out the frankincense, gold, and myrrh as proof? Or did Jesus just know, intuitively, sensing that he had a special divine connection? I wonder if Jesus ever looked at his reflection in the waters of a local well and asked, who am I? In the same way that I look at my reflection in my bathroom mirror and ask, who am I? Jesus who? Heather who? Stuart who? Francis who? Carl who? Mark who? Cindy who? Marie who? And then God speaks. And the first time that we hear God speak is over Jesus in baptism at the river. The angels sing at his birth, but Jesus does not speak until the river. This decisive moment of Jesus' public life, the moment when he hears the divine affirmation, you are my beloved and you I am well pleased. This moment when Jesus is claimed and called by God, this is who Jesus is. For those of us who are baptized as babies, there was that person that stood there over those waters to mark us and the mystery of the Spirit to claim us and to say those words over us. Do you know who you are, John? You are God's. 
Do you know who you are, Frank? You are God's, right? Do you know who you are, Kathy? You are God's. And if you were baptized as an adult as I was, even if maybe I can remember the particularities, what did I bring? For it was God who spoke, not me. And if you notice in Jesus' baptism, he doesn't say or do anything except step in and receive. It was all done from the top down. It was all a matter of God claiming Jesus, just as in your own baptism, God said to you and says to you, this is who you are. You are mine, Wendy. Paul Tillich says it very well. Salvation is simply accepting the fact that we have already been accepted. Say, I'm accepted. That we are already beloved by God. Say, I'm beloved. And when God says, I am well pleased with you, a great other translation for that in my life is, I am proud of you. Say, God is proud of me. This is the identity we lean into every single day of our life. For in baptism, our baptism, or in the baptism that we are going to say yes to in our lives, we are claimed and we are called and we are given our identity. And today, we get to come forward and remember to ourselves touch the water and say yes again and to receive and to accept what has already been done. Accepting the fact that we have already been accepted. You know, it took Jesus 30 years, didn't it, to get to the water's edge? And after he claimed his identity, his struggle continued. It didn't, it didn't stop there. It started there because the very next thing that happened is he was tempted three times in the desert, right? And that temptation was all about his identity. Give over your identity, Jesus. And even after that, the struggle continued in the garden, right? Take this cup, Lord, I don't know. And on the cross, where are you, God? Do you love me or have you left me? And so God comes in the midst of our struggle to the font this morning to again claim and name us as beloved. But, but remembering, coming and remembering today is not just about you and your identity. It's also about the person sitting next to you or the person sitting in front of you because they're beloved as well. They're claimed by God as well. So this also has to do with your coworker who's driving you crazy. This also has to do with the family that was at the Christmas table. Some of them you love, some of them you don't like, and you're trying to love. This is about them as well. For they are also beloved by God, called and claimed by God. One day, a young fugitive trying to hide himself from the enemy entered into a small village. The kind people said, come on in, we'll hide you. The soldiers arrived and said, if you don't tell us where this young fugitive is, by tomorrow morning, we're going to burn your village and you with it. The village people, in fear, turned to their rabbi and said, what do we do? The rabbi went into his room and closed the door and began to pray and read the Bible. All night until finally he read these words, it is better for one man to die than a whole people lost. And so he opened his door and gave over the young fugitive to the enemy. The village erupted in party and praise because they had been saved. But the rabbi retreated to his room, deeply sorrow-filled as the young boy was led away to be killed. There came an angel to him who said to the rabbi, what have you done? Well, I, I turned the boy over to the enemy, to which the angel said, did you not know he was the Messiah? How, how would I know that, the rabbi said. And then the angel said to the rabbi, 
If you had only looked up from your reading, if you had only gone and sat with the boy and looked into his eyes, you would have known. You would have known. We're invited this morning to come and to look at our reflection in this water. To see our life, to see ourselves, to look into the mirror and see into our own eyes and see looking back the God who created us and who claims us again today. And then we're invited to turn and to be encouraged and challenged to look into the eyes of the people that God has placed around us and recognize the same. Jesus who? Heather who? Duke Memorial who? You see, brothers and sisters in Christ, through this sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ church. Not your church, not my church, Christ church. Incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation. And we're given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. And so today, through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledging what God is doing for us, already has done and is still doing for us, and confirm our commitment to Christ's church. Church, I invite you to stand. As we enter into this affirmation, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, oppression, in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? If so, say, I will. I will. You may be seated. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos and mess, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water, and after the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. And when you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the water, through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you had promised. And in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb, baptized by John, anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit, and by this gift of water, call to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our baptism. For you have washed away our sins, clothe us with righteousness. Yes, in you we are named and claimed beloved. We invite you today to come and reaffirm your baptism, to reclaim your identity this year, this new year, and who God created you to be. In baptism, the pastor, right, gives the water out. And that's a sign that there's nothing that we can do, nothing we have to do to receive God's grace. But today, your response is one of thanksgiving. And so we invite you to reach into the water, to touch the water, to form the sign of the cross on your forehead or to, to wash your hands as a, a sign of your washing your life in the identity that God has given 
There will be four stations up here. Uh, the ministry team, as the rest of them come forward, we will create space in smaller vessels for you to touch, to receive, and to reaffirm who you are, whose you are in Christ. If for some reason you can't come forward today, let a friend or an usher know and we will bring the water to you. And the rail, of course, is open. I invite you to reaffirm and then to pray as you lean into your identity in Christ in this new year. There is no order. There aren't any ushers for this. This is simply you responding as you feel called to respond, to come, to know who you are because of whose you are this day.